The views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of the staff of K98 Talk or the Spark Radio Network. Did you tweet it out? We're live. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go. <laughs> no, I didn't tweet it out. Nice one. Wait a sec. I-, I had the volume down. Great job, everybody. <laughs> That's my fault. Oh, you're not plugged in. No, you had the volume down? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's start... <laughs> Oh, Green sucks effect for the, you know, forget this. Forget the theme song. Let's I'll just go. No, the gun's perfect. Okay, fine. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. That brings me back to the old show. <laughs> Every show we've done used to start like this. You know, since we became Adam Frank, we have had fewer technical problems. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I mean, in the beginning we had a bunch. Yeah, that's true. Those were all Herman's fault. That's true. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone, welcome to the Anna Franken Show. Sorry, we were starting the show talking about comedy and the Charleston shooting and all. We accidentally hit a gunshot sound effect. Uh, that was not planned. That, that's just art in the moment. But anyway, theme song, rabble, 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 victim mafia, rabble, rabble. Okay. Two things we're going to talk about today. My good friend, Dave Rubin, is going to call in in about 15 minutes. He's a host of the Rubin Report. He used to be on the Young Turks. I think now he's moving on to other places. I don't know what I can or should say or shouldn't say about his career choices. I'll let him uh, fill in the blanks. But um, if you haven't found Dave Rubin yet or seen the Rubin Report on YouTube, you should definitely check him out. He's a really, really bright guy. He's a stand-up. Uh, him and I agree across the board on most things. Um, he started off, you know, a gay Jewish uh, liberal, basically, when he went to the Young Turks, and actually has become a little bit more moderate. Um, and a lot of it was the Young Turks, um, their view on Israel, because they're, they're very anti-Zionist there, and he's a Jew, and they had a creative difference. And anyway, he started to kind of push to the center, where I am, and he sees a lot of problems with the left that I see. And I think it's interesting that Dave and I will talk about this stuff. We're going to talk about comedy and the left and the political correctness movement because I grew up left wing. Uh, I, my family members are comics. Uh, some of them are super successful at it. And, you know, we came from the comedy background of liberal politics. And here we are talking about how the left wing is destroying <laughs> not just comedy but this nation in a whole. So it's an interesting conversation. Um, the number to call in, if you're listening now or you've finally gathered that you have the testicular fortitude to call in, today is the day. The number is 855-920-9922. Herman will be there to answer your calls, and he'll send me a note. If you got something interesting to talk about, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, but before we get to Dave Rubin and the left and political correctness and blah, 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 we can't ignore the elephant in the room, which is the Charleston, South Carolina shooting. Is it South Carolina? South. Um, and like always, we always plan the show through the, through the week and uh, we have a certain format. And then like Thursday of every week or Wednesday or Friday after we plan the show, some nut job goes on a shooting spree or some person gets shot by a cop or wrestled to the ground and we kind of have to scramble. We do want to be topical. And so we're going to spend the first 15 minutes talking about the shooting before David calls in. So if you have any notes, topics, questions about the shooting, again, the number is 858, I'm sorry, 855-920-9922. Okay. So what do we know, guys? We know this seemingly... I'm obviously mentally ill person, Dylan Roof. What's his full name? He has three names. They all have three names. Dylan, only... Dylan Storm Roof. <laughs> <laughs> Storm. Storm Roof. That's his real name, Dylan Storm Roof? Yes. Do you ever notice it's always the three name people? Lee Harvey Oswald, John Wilkes Booth, John Wayne Gacy. We give them three names. Oh. They, so, they're they they're born with three names, but we use three names. I think it adds some sort of hmm. oomph to That's it. That's an interesting <laughs> observation. never thought about it. Anyway, beware of three names. Uh, Dylan Storm Roof went into a Christian church, and let's be honest, it's a black church. Um, I'm sure everyone there that's Christian is welcome, but it's predominantly black. Sat in a church group, went there with the um, distinct notion to kill people there. He came armed. He goes in this church group ready to fire, and he starts finding these Christian guys are pretty nice. So he ends up staying for something like 45 minutes, right, Ned? About an hour. About an hour. And he's like, hey, these people aren't so bad. But then he's like, well, shit, I came here. I loaded a gun. Black people are the problem. Uh, Hell, Hitler. And he killed nine of them. I think he injured three others. Um, was it six men and, and three women, I believe, all black. Uh, went on, on the run 
uh, Free Jahar style and was eventually caught. Uh, now you'll see pictures of him holding the Confederate flag. He looks like, you said this, Ned, I want to give you credit for it, but he does look like uh, <laughs> Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber, right? Uh, Lloyd Christmas from Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> Which is Jim Carrey's character in Dumb and Dumber. He's the same haircut, and he's creepy looking, dude. You see his picture, and, he, and he's got, and there's new footage today of him, you know, stepping on an American why, flag. Why do they always look like that? They always look like this nerdy kind of ginger video game in the basement playing kid. Well, it's really a, pale. It's a really interesting question. It is. Uh, you can profile that, and that's something that you know. Maybe you're joking or not, but it is very. I'm not true. joking. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I have a theory. If you're asking me my opinion, um, I think when you're a loner, if you're a weirdo, or you're mentally ill, <coughs> and you sort of withdraw into your own head and your own life, and you're not out there partying, having friends, you you have less of a desire to take care of your physical presence you're not you're not impressing anyone when you're in your room all day so they start to get really white they're not getting sunlight i mean they're inside all day whether they're playing video games or whatnot they're, these are not people out in the beach playing volleyball 10 hours a day you know what i mean so they're really pale they have horrible haircuts and they're crazy and there's no one checking them there's no one uh that they're reaching out to or communicating with to open their mind or see a different world they've made up their mind and they have confirmation bias everything they research everything they look about agrees with what they're feeling. And so they start to withdraw. And a withdrawn person is going to have that sort of crazy eye look. It's going to be pale. It's going to have a shitty haircut. He's not going to have the finest threads and dress nice. He's going to look like a wall Martian every time. And I think that's what it is. And uh, obviously this is a troubled kid. Uh, he's, he's mentally ill, I think it's safe to say. He's obviously racist. And what he did was obviously a horrendous act. And, and a terrorist act. Yeah. You know, when you go into churches and schools, it's it's a different level than out in public where both the murder is equally bad, but the terror it gives to the people around you um, is significant. So I think they go to these places where no one's armed and it's an innocent, safe place and yeah. shoot them up. And they all plan. I mean, uh, Dylan, uh, shoot, Shooter McGavin Roof. What's his name again? Dylan Shooter Roof. Storm. Storm room. <laughs> shooter McGavin. Uh, just like James Holmes, uh, just like the Sandy Hook shooter, Adam Lanza, they plan these well in advance. And this is there's a couple things I want to discuss with this news angle because, yeah, it was some racist white trash while Martian goes and kills nine black people. He's got the Confederate flag. That's obviously going to get everyone talking about race. And I'm, I, I want to approach it from a different angle because everyone's got that covered. Race is covered. In America, race sells papers. We talk about race. We talk about race on this show every but week. But this one is race. It clearly is. So that's one point. I don't feel I need to discuss it. It's obvious. This is a racist piece of shit. He killed him because they were black. Uh, I don't know what discussion we're going to have that's going to help prevent racism, that's going to stop it. This is, this is a pretty clear-cut case. But there are other things I want to approach because whenever one of these shootings happens, I start looking at it different than other people. I don't care if he's racist. I think it's wrong, of course. But to me, I don't think a racist person just becomes a serial killer. I don't think if you just grew up and your dad's like, hey, black people are stupid, you're going to go into a Christian church and shoot nine innocent people that you spend an hour with. I think there has to be something wrong with you. I think you have to be mental. And when I look at these cases, I look at what was this person's childhood like? Uh, were they in treatment? Were they under care of a, a psychiatrist or psychologist? Were they on medications? These are the more interesting approaches that I take, and I wish that more people in this country did, because every time this happened, we go to the flag, we go to race, and we go to guns. And we wonder why none of this ever gets solved. We wonder why these seem to happen every week. And then we all scratch our head going, oh, let's stop racism. Like, you're just going to fucking magically stop it one night. Why don't we look at something a little deeper? 96 to 97% of these mass shooters, and we're just talking about mass shooters like this, not your handgun shooting stats when someone accidentally shoots somebody or they kill themselves. But these terrorist acts, okay, Sandy Hook, what happened this week, 96% of these gentlemen, and I use that term ironically, were on an antidepressant. Okay, now I know a lot of our listeners... Or are, withdrawing from... Or withdrawing. They were in treatment. And I know a lot of our audience has been here with us for years. It's like, oh God. But remember, Anne and Frank are new. Uh, Anne and Frank have not talked about antidepressants yet. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I know, but you should say prescription drugs. Cause prescription they drugs. Weren't all You're on. right. Very okay. good point. Prescription drugs. Psychotropics. 
Um, and I think that's an interesting part of the conversation. Now, I may be more anti anti depressants, more anti prescription drugs than the normal person. I'll give you that. But it still should be part of the conversation. If you're going to talk about gun control and you're going to talk about racism, why is this the third possibility not ever discussed? And that's all I'm asking for. I'm not going to sit here and say, let's bash on drugs. But why isn't it part of the conversation? Why is it just going to stop at gun control and racism? And religion. Just and so you know, the conservatives or Christians are saying this is an attack on right. their religion because it was in a church. And, and the reason these things continue to happen is because we never focus on the source. We never look at these situations the way they need to be looked at. We looked at them how we feel they should be looked at. We look at what will get clickbait or conversation going, or where can I put my opinion out there and be interesting. The fact that 96% of these shooters were on a prescribed drug is something you cannot ignore. You just can't ignore it. You can't brush it off. If 96% of these shooters had one type of cough syrup in their blood, it would be pulled off the shelves tomorrow. But what about all the people that it helps? It helps so many people, way more people than crazy people going and shooting. This is the question I get when I talk about it. Thank you. That was good, though. This, I love it. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, asking you because that's what people ask. So. Well, I get this, this question a lot, because, and it's weird. Okay. They'll say things like, what about all the people it helps? Okay? Here's my response. Tryptophan is illegal and was for years because one person died on it. Turns out they weren't even they didn't even die on tryptophan. Yeah, the shit in Turkey. Yeah, you can't buy it in the shelf. Um, uh, the baby cribs, if everyone remembers that, uh, people bought these cribs and put them together wrong. Okay, the, the cribs themselves weren't bad. The cribs collapsed. Babies died. They pulled the cribs off the market. Americans in general are very reactive and stupid. One one baby death actually will make them recall an entire crib and an entire line of car seats. Right. So that uh, doesn't surprise. Remember people. the accelerator and Toyota. When they were pinned in the ground and people were driving to telephone poles, they recalled all those Toyotas. They fixed them. Okay, so you can sit here and say, what about all the people helps? Well, what about all the people driving Toyotas that got to work safely? Okay? What about all the people that put the crib together fine? It's a small percentage of people. Here? Well, well, hold okay. on a second. It's a small percentage of anybody that's ever hurt. But why anywhere else when somebody's hurt or when someone's negligent are we more than happy to pull it off the shelf or ask for a recall why is this the one fucking thing in america that nobody wants to do it nobody wants to look at it nobody wants to talk about it. i find it mind-blowing what is your question ned uh i was just going to ask although there's extraordinary per- like there's a huge percentage of what would you say 96 percent something like that of these yeah. mass shootings where according to one website I found okay it, but yeah that they were on prescription medications. Yeah. Well, although it's an incredible coincidence, how do you prove that just because they, they've taken prescription drugs that this causes them to kill people? Well, here's the next point, which is so fascinating about this. Everyone will talk about gun control. we got to pull guns. That's all anyone's talking about now. Got to pull guns, got to pull guns, right? we got to regulate guns, got to regulate guns. Um, they'll, they'll go to, I'm sorry, what was your question? I just lost my point. Just yeah. because it's a, a, a huge coincidence that all these shooters were on medications. Although they were on medications, how do you prove that this was the cause for them to, co- okay. to deal with these mass shootings? It is a known side effect, according to the APA, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, and according to all pharmaceutical companies. It is a known side effect. Not a secret. Not a can happen once in a while. It's a known side effect that psychotropics can cause things like mania, which is when you're fucking crazy. That's what mania means. Uh, Suicidal ideation, which means increased thoughts of wanting to kill yourself, or homicidal ideation. So, again, let's factor this in. The cribs, everyone's like, what about all the people helped? These pills are causative. Now, a gun sits in a room and doesn't hurt anybody. I have a gun in this room. I won't even tell you guys where it is. Don't worry. It's not going to crawl out and shoot us, right? (laughs) It's a fucking inanimate object. But a pill is known to cause you to become manic, homicidal, and suicidal. Okay? So now you factor in 96% of these shooters were on a drug that is known to cause you to go murdery. And we still aren't looking at it. We're still going to talk about the guns. Guns are not causative. A gun is inanimate. A person grabs a gun, it becomes a weapon. Otherwise, it's a fucking book holder, bookshelf, whatever, bookend. A pill actually ingested can make you go crazy, can make you murder, okay? So now we have a direct link. 96% of these people are on this drug must be a coincidence. Oh, wait, 
you're telling me this drug also causes people to want to shoot people <laughs> and they're all on it? Again, tryptophan would be pulled off the shelf. Crib would be pulled off the shelf. Toyota would be pulled off the shelf. Not drugs. And I'll tell you why. Because I know I'm asking you, why are we ignoring it? Because everybody's on them. That's it. There's your answer. 40 million people are on them, and they feel the need to defend it. I get in this fight all the time. People think I'm coming after them. If the pills work for you, great. You're not one of the people that's going to go shoot up a fucking school. Congrats. I'm really proud of you that you're not going to murder anybody. These so, drugs... Oh, go ahead. So it sounds like the combination between someone who is very uh, asocial... Uh, very withdrawn from other people combined with the side effects from these prescription medications that change your mind would be a recipe for disaster it sounds like and, and gun availability which is what everyone wants to yeah. argue like because guns are available does that make it um, easier for them to kill people no really how I mean it's right there they can just pick up a gun yeah but they can pick up fucking uh, they can they can put fucking ball bearings in a pressure cooker at a goddamn Boston Marathon and set the fucking timer and blow people to fucking smithereens probably more than nine people too yeah I think what's more effective a fucking pressure cooking bomb full of ball bearings or a handgun Remember the farmer's market guy in his car? And he yeah, like, took down bastard. like 20 people. <laughs> I'm more scared of a fucking senile bastard driving a car than I am. Um, he did something no, and he accelerated. Said, he said he thought the accelerator was the brake. So he saw people goes, oh shit, because it's so fucking old too old to drive. Right. He mashed the accelerator trying he, to stop the car. He was having a heart attack while that happened. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh. So <laughs> Dylan could have waited till these people came out of church and just accelerated is the point you're making? Like they. The point is, the tool someone chooses. Again, this, okay. This is what I don't understand with people. Everyone is, is no one's looking into it throughout the media. That's w why is this not discussed? And the other thing is, why and do it we has focus? Been reported. Of course, yeah. it's always reported. It's just people ignore it because they're all on drugs. They read it and go, "Oh God, uh, that that makes me uncomfortable. I'm on this shit." Are yeah. oh, you mean I'm going to go fucking kill somebody? <laughs> no, you're wrong, uh, Frank. <laughs> and they throw it away. That's what happens. Because yeah. they, they only do it with this. It tells me it's an emotional reaction. Yeah. They ignore this one thing. These are the same people that want fucking guns to be regulated. They want alcohol to be regulated. They want everything regulated except the thing known to cause you to murder people. Leave that one One alone. of the things known. One of the things. Yeah. Uh, what was your question? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so angry. No, I think you made the point. So I wanted to ask The point is, why do we focus on the tool? If somebody murders someone, why does it matter if it's with a fucking ice pick, a knife, a car, or a pressure cooker full of fucking ball bearings? Why does that matter? You're going to pull fucking pressure cookers off the shelf? Why don't we focus on the actual lunatic that's mentally fucking deranged and homicidal who is going to use whatever he is going to use to kill people? Why don't we focus on the mental health of shooters? Why don't we talk about the fact that they're on fucking drugs known to cause them to go fucking crazy? The fact that they don't have therapy in this country that's free. The fact you can't even afford fucking therapy. So if you're born bad shit crazy, tough luck fucker. And you're not going to get put in a mental hospital because no, that's a social program. Republicans don't like to pay for that shit. You're on the street, you homeless psycho fucking path. Hopefully you don't have access to a goddamn pressure cooker. We don't give a shit. Fuck you. What flag are you using? That's all we care about. What weapon or tool did you use? That's what we're going to focus on. We're just going to make everything illegal and it'll go away. No. Mentally fucking deranged killers are your problem, people. It's not guns. It's not flags. It's the people that are batshit fucking crazy and kill without remorse. And now if you factor in the fact that 96% of them are on a drug that makes them feel no remorse and feel mania and feel homicidal ideation, 96% of them are on this drug, and it happens every fucking time. I call it before it's ever reported in the news. I fucking nailed that they're on a drug. Why is that not part of the conversation? That's all I ask. You don't have to be crazy like me and pull everyone off drugs. Fine. I'm fucking too far gone. I get it. But when the conversation is flags, guns, and race, that should be in there. That should be part of the conversation. That is the least I ask. And just for the record, uh, Apparently he was arrested before, uh, several months prior to this horrible incident at a Bed Bath & Body Works store where police found orange strips on him, mm -hmm. and he told officers he's, he was on a drug called sub Suboxone, yeah, which is a narcotic yeah. that is used to treat opiate addiction, and this drug is habit-forming and has been connected with sudden bursts, uh, outbursts of aggression. So this is on record. We're not yeah. just kind of making this up. No, I'm not up. making this up. And yeah. the same, same with all of them. And right. again, and, and everything I say about antidepressants causing these things, if you don't believe me, go read the goddamn warning label on them. It's on the fucking pill box. It's like I'm the guy telling people 25 years ago that cigarettes will cause lung cancer, and everyone's looking at me like I'm a fucking buffoon. 
And I'm pointing at the side of the box that says, no, they have a link to fucking lung cancer here, you sons of bitches. Smoking is bad. And everyone's like, oh, don't fucking tell me what to do. That's what's happening. The link is already there. There have been millions of lawsuits. There have been people that have died in laboratories. There have been the fucking... It's not even a smoking gun anymore. It's not even smoke. It's full on fire. It's there. It's there. I tell it every fucking week. And because everyone's on drugs, they don't want to hear it. But you're on a fucking dangerous drug. And you want to tell me, oh, what it helps me? Fuck you. Alcohol helps tons of people. Look at the people that are fucking shy and shut in. They go to a party. They're the life of the party. They're getting laid left and right. <laughs> but fuck, let's get that shit illegal. You can't drive drunk because you might hurt somebody. Well, that's what I'm saying. Great. It makes you feel better. You might shoot somebody. Fucking regulate it. 10,000 a year before you, I know our guest is on hold, yeah, but 10,000 people on, Dave, a year die from DUIs and, you know, driving a car under yeah. the influence. Um, about many? 350 a year for the guns, for murder type. 350,000? 350. Like, You're wait just a minute. talking about murders? You're Murder. saying more people die from drunk driving than they do from guns. Of course like they 10, do. Like 10,000 people. Right, so that's why do. don't we focus on DUIs and shit right now? But DUIs, are, it is illegal. We have focused on it. But they get more than one chance. One time you kill somebody, you don't get back out home. No, the point is, alcohol's fucking totally legal. That's my, that's my, so it's like, oh, you can drink, just don't drive and drink, right? And still, people, alcohol makes you do stupid shit, right? So you can take meds, but maybe you shouldn't have guns in your home, which is a law we all support. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, not, we don't all support that. What I'm trying to say <laughs> is, we can all look at alcohol. I know it sounds like I'm going against my point, but I'm actually making my point. David, I'm coming to you right now. Uh, let me just finish this point. Everyone is more than aware that alcohol, while legal, has dangerous repercussions, right? We all understand that when you're alcohol, when you're inebriated, you make poor decisions and you should not operate a car because you might kill somebody, right? We all know that, right? I'm not saying anything new, right? Hello? Yes, Anyone? Yes. So why don't we apply that same logic to fucking antidepressants and pharmaceutical drugs? Yeah, they may help some people. Some people are on them. They may fucking tell you the time of their life is great. Just like when someone's drunk, they're having the fucking best party of their life. But we understand there's negative repercussions. There's a way to handle it. And there's regulation and laws in place to protect us. And even then, there's still 10,000 deaths a year because people still fucking ignore it. So the bottom line is we are all aware that alcohol has negative influences. Why do we ignore the same with antidepressants? I don't understand it. All right, enough of that. I'm sweating. All right. Um, I don't know how I'm going to segue from this to political correctness and comedy with Dave Rubin, but he's a pro. He'll help me. Dave, you're on the air. Can you Guys, hear me? I just snorted a couple lines of Lexapro. So let's <laughs> well, we have about 10 minutes before you go to a mall and shoot everybody. You don't have any guns, do you? I don't have any guns, but now that I snorted this shit, I'm ready to, uh, <laughs> to stock up. Uh, I don't know how much you heard. I know I know we have a specific thing we want to talk about, but you've yeah. seen this shooting, and I don't know if you agree with me or not, but my my premise is this, essentially. We can focus on guns, and we can focus on race. Why aren't we focusing on the mental health part of this story, at least part of the conversation? Yeah. Let me tell you one anecdotal little thing about prescription drugs. There was a time in my life for about six months where I went on Lexapro, which is a pretty low-grade antidepressant. This is about maybe six years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm on this stuff for about six months, and at the end of it, I realized I couldn't really feel anything. Right. Uh, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, died in a car accident, and I wasn't particularly sad. Like, I knew it had done something to me that I didn't want done to me. So I stopped taking it. And, you know, when you, when you stop taking these things, because they're doing some serious damage to your brain they're rewiring your brain yes uh you know you're supposed to wean yourself off you're supposed to really talk to your psychiatrist right. who tells you how to do it but i was like ah you know instead of taking one every day i'll take one every other day and then maybe every third day blah 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 and let me guess you almost so killed yourself this. right well listen to this I, I kid you not i kid you not when i did this for about two weeks i could hear in my brain remember old school computers when you turn on like a desktop computer and before it would go on you hear like whirring and buzzing and yes. all that shit like starting up. I literally heard that sound. I could feel that sound in my brain. I mean, think about that. Think about that. That's no, terrifying. Like a pretty low grade thing for six months, and I could feel my brain actually rebooting. So I am a hundred percent with you on this. For yeah. all we have ridiculous racial problems in this country, we have ridiculous socioeconomic problems. And, and systemic stuff, all of that. 
But mental health, there's a reason that all of these people are on drugs. I'm totally with you. We are drugging people, and then we wonder why they go bonkers, even though the half of the commercials are telling you all the horrible things like suicide and diarrhea. Uh, so <laughs> uh, yes. Which is worse? Hot right? dog fingers is my favorite. I thought that was a joke. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can have a, you can t- you have a stomach problem, so then you take something that gives you diarrhea. I mean, that's really what we're doing here. So, uh, yeah, it, this is. I think this is hugely about drugs. I'd say seventy five percent, and that doesn't discount all the racial shit and all and the terrible media that we have and all that stuff. Right. Uh, but we are drugging people. There's a reason, as you said. It's not just one of them. It's not just two of them. Every single one, we find out three days later that they're on the same mind-bending psychotic drug. It's a coincidence. Guess what? They're not on weed. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's never weed. Nobody's taking, a, nobody's taking bong hits and running around and starts shooting people for racial reasons. No, they're taking you know? naps. As far as I know. <laughs> no, they're sleeping. Exactly. That's what they are. They're taking naps. Did you have a question there? Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm fully on board. There's uh, a delay, so, so just throw it in there. So the, anti- the function of the antidepressant, when it works... Is is when the patient is experiencing basically no feelings whatsoever. That they're, they're numb. Is that when you're uh, supposed? I don't know to... if that's how it's. Uh, yeah, I don't know yeah. if that's how it's supposed to be. I mean, that's what it. That's what it kind of did for me. I mean, literally, a childhood friend who I had known since I was three years old died, mm-hmm. and I happened to be with my family who had known him for. You know, everyone had known this guy for twenty some odd years. Everybody was hysterical, crying, and I wasn't. Right. And I was like, all right, I know, I know something. Something's not right here. So I don't know if it's numbing, if it's supposed to numb you. Look, and it does work for some people. So um, when, it, when you say it works for the, some people, it, it makes them happy by numbing their feelings? Well, I think uh, I, I had a friend who was, like, pretty bipolar, manic kind of thing, and she got on lithium, yeah. and she got her shit together. She did. So I can't say that all of this stuff is horrible. Um, but, you know, again, I, I'm a believer that the stuff is natural. The stuff that actually grows out of the earth. So weed, shrooms, you want to do a little ayahuasca, I've been meaning to try that. Sounds good. That stuff's all fine. But all this other stuff, there's a, you know, this guy that I went to who prescribed me the, uh, the Lexapro, I went in there and I said to him, I want, um, I wanted, uh, what's like that basic thing that people take, uh, Xanax. I wanted Xanax to fly. I don't really like to fly. Yeah. I was like, can I get some Xanax to fly? He literally tried to dis- uh, prescribe me a drug that I had never heard of before. Uh, and he said that I had time shift disorder because, you know, I fly from L.A. to New York and I'm getting time shift disorder, <laughs> yep. which that sounds like the, literally the biggest bullshit name of disorder you could possibly you mean jet uh, lag? make up. Yeah. That's so should... right, jet lag. Yeah, that's yeah. what we know it as, jet lag. <laughs> yeah, it, and that's what I said to him. And he literally would not let me leave without taking this prescription for it. So I did take it, and I just threw it out when I got downstairs. He also gave me the van, which I don't take any of that shit anymore, actually. Good. I got all of that stuff. Good. Um, but, yeah, so now I just, I'm on a plane and I fucking freak out, but whatever. Yeah, yeah but that's... I'm alive. Well, you're on a fucking plane. It's terrifying. Like, I was, people are like, oh, I hate to fly. Well, of course, you're in a fucking metal tube 10,000 feet in the air that could drop <laughs> at any second. You should be terrified. I mean, what's wrong with you that you wouldn't be? A couple of weeks ago, I was flying. I was flying back from New York during the uh, what was the big horse thing? The Triple Crown. What, what race was that? On my stake? Yeah, the last one. The, the last one. Whatever the last one was. So I was on JetBlue where they have TVs. Everybody's watching this. The horse wins. Everybody starts applauding, and I think this is hilarious. I'm in a fucking plane, you know, twenty thousand feet in the air. This little metal box. And people are applauding that a guy ran a horse, uh, <laughs> you know, half a mile. Away. So like, does anyone get the irony? Yeah, it's pretty really crazy. Well, I, you you went over a couple things that I just want to back up, and then we'll get off this topic because I know people are are getting yeah. tired of it. But a uh, couple things just in your story when you're talking about your your friend dying and the way the doctor yeah. wouldn't let you leave without pills. This is the other part of the story that I never get to tell. Um, I I know what I'm talking about with this stuff. Um, what happens is when I first got like anti antidepressants as I say uh, someone very close to me was on them and it just didn't seem right to me just the logic it never it never entered my head properly I'm thinking wait a minute you're depressed you're supposed to be depressed because your life's depressing why are you trying to mask that or medicate out of it because why don't you focus yeah. on changing your life and getting away from the thing that depresses you that just makes sense and so I already had sort of a logic app so I started to research it 
And the thing I uncovered 10 years ago that still frightened me to this day is the APA, the uh, American Psychi- Psychiatrist Association, I think it stands for, um, were getting kickbacks from pharmaceutical companies for of every course. time they prescribed it. So I'm looking, I'm like, wait a minute, that is illegal. That would be illegal in any other business. If you're saying, you take this medicine, I'm going to get a 10% cut. That, that's negligent. Of and it was known, but it was buried. So I started to research, what, you know, how do we stop this? They actually had a, a team of lawyers that would go out and in the press, they had a publicity wing, the APA and the NIM, to bury this. They didn't want people to know. And, and you could find it if you did the research, which I did. So I start looking at the pills themselves. I go, wait a minute, they're getting a kickback. So do they believe in it? Do they believe in these drugs or are they just doing it for money? So we started researching the drugs. And this is the smoking fucking gun right here. The drugs that work, quote unquote, barely outperform placebo. Two to one. Yeah. So when everyone Listen. throws it in my face, hey, these drugs work, what they're telling me is these drugs work twice as much as a pill of sugar where you're lied to that they work. Any other drug would not get passed if it only outperformed placebo two to one times. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. You know, there, Do your research. There's a, reason, there's a reason that when you go into a psychiatrist's office, that he has a freaking stapler that says <laughs> Prozac. <laughs> like a product <laughs> placement. Mug. Yeah. You know what I mean? He has a coffee mug that says, uh, give me another one of these drugs. Well, Butrin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, we'll start shouting Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and the other thing is the, the way they market them. Of course, it's all bullshit. And the way they market them now, it used to at least be real human. Now, in the way they market them, it's cartoons. Right. And you're being followed by a cloud that's chasing you around all day. Like, there is a, there is a machine here, yeah. and they want everybody to be drugged, of course. Uh, and they want everybody to not have real emotions. Actually, Bill Maher does a really funny bit about this, that, you know, humans and every living animal is supposed to live with a certain amount of fear, a certain amount of anxiety, and he, he says something about a squirrel. You ever see a squirrel just sitting out in the, in the, in the, by a tree? A squirrel is eating a nut, it's freaking out, right? It's right. every which way the whole time, and it's fucking freaking out. Because it, you know, it could be eaten anytime, it could be hit by a car, right. whatever. And it's like, human, guess what? There's a lot of shit out there, and if you just drug that shit, it doesn't, make, it doesn't mean the shit goes away. It means that you just can't respond to it as functionally. Right. And uh, it, it's one of the biggest, I, I think, look, as I said, the race stuff is a huge problem. Absolutely. Everyone's afraid, everyone's afraid to talk about the mental health part and the, and the drug part. Because everybody's on these drugs. Yeah. Every one of these fucking freaks that you see on TV preaching about all this race stuff and blah, blah, blah they're all on the very drugs <laughs> that these people are on. It's absolutely the true. No, all the talking heads on TV yeah. are all on drugs. They're all on these prescription drugs because they know they're selling bullshit and they get depressed about it. Like, I know yeah. fucking Sean Hannity goes to work in the morning. He's like, I'm fucking Satan. I'm going to kill myself. And he pops a couple of effects on <laughs> and he's like, oh, no, I'm just a talking. I'm doing my job. <laughs> like, you have it's to fucking be. It's pretty depressing saying that shit all day. You're right. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, let's go. Just, you know. There's, there's just all I'm asking for is this to be in the national conversation. That's it. I, if I were president, or if I had power, or a more popular show, that would be my life mission. Get this in the conversation. We don't even have to regulate it or change the laws if you don't want to. Let's just talk about mm-hmm. it. Let's throw it in there with everything yeah. else. It's crazy. All right. Yeah. Well, let's have some fun, shall we? That was depressing. I need a fucking antidepressant now. Um, yeah. Hold on. Let me crush up one more line. <laughs> do a, do a quick bump. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, the reason I wanted to have you on, I mean, we, I, I don't know if you heard my intro of you. I hope I didn't get you in trouble. I didn't say anything bad, but I told him about the uh-oh, Ruben uh-oh. report. No, I just said the Ruben report that was in the Young Turks. And now you're, yep. I said you're transitioning, but I didn't know where. I didn't name anything. So what am I allowed to say, not allowed to say? Because uh, I, I want to promote well, you. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's YouTube.com slash Ruben report. And we have a, we have a big announcement to be made this week. Okay. There's the final touches are being put on the paper literally this weekend so i can't i can't exactly say but but something really cool and good and uh but the, the youtube channel will remain the same so it's youtube.com so report. ruben report i i highly recommend people watch it it's uh i've been uh in the room while some of these are um yeah being produced shall we say and uh you know you're i think you're great man i watch you i study you i don't know if i ever told you that thanks well, uh, listen, it's, uh, well, I appreciate that, and it's, listen, you know, it's, I always say, it's not hard to speak when you're telling the truth, and I don't know that I'm right about everything, but I do speak uh, truthfully as best the way I see it, and of course I'm going to get some shit wrong every now and again, and that's fine, 
But, you know, everybody in the news pretends they know everything all the time. I don't know everything. I'll give you the best educated guess I have at it, you know. Uh, and, that, and that's all you can do. And I think people appreciate a little authenticity because we have these drugged up, uh, you know, cable news blowhard yeah. screaming at everybody. Well, I do know everything, just for the record. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> noted, noted. But you and I uh, have bonded as sorts when we talk about, and again, stop me if anything's uncomfortable, um, but no, no, is it know, safe to say, the way I introduced you before you were on hold was, we, you and I kind of grew up similar politics, we're kind of left-leaning, um, mm-hmm. and we've sort of, I don't want to say evolved, because I don't, I don't think a political I, is an evolution of sorts, but we've changed over the years. We're, we're kind of becoming more moderate. That's fair to say, yes? Oh, for sure. Okay. I mean, I, until the last, look, these last two and a half years of my life, I've been pretty deep embedded with progressive. Yeah. Progressive. And that's, progressives are far left, so they're left of liberal. I will always, always stand for liberal principles, liberal beliefs. So I'm for gay rights, I'm for women's rights. I'm for reproductive rights. I'm for minority rights, things of that nature, mm-hmm. a fair tax system. Me Those too. are liberal principles. Um, but progressives have fully gone off the deep end. This is the segue to where you're going with this. Yeah. But they've fully gone off the deep end when it comes to speech and yes. political correctness and not calling out bullshit when they see it. Um, and we could even bring it back uh, in a little bit to, to the shooting and how they're dealing with shooting. Uh, but but free speech is literally the most important thing we have as Americans, and I see one side trying to trample it, and sadly that's the far left. I have to agree. Um, you know, I know you haven't listened to this show a lot, if at all, but our enemy of the state on this show is uh, something I call the victim mafia, and I don't even identify them with oh, yeah. progressives or the left anymore because, again, I am left on a lot of things. I'm, I'm stand for liberal policies like you do. I don't think it's fair to just say, oh, the left is crazy. It's To me, it's this sort of subgroup of extremists that I call the victim mafia, and what they are are a group that uses faux victimization to gain political mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, public leverage. And what's happening yeah, by is... by the way, wait, real quick, this, yeah. this is... Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the far right is any better. Right, But I course. don't even consider myself... I, I have nothing to do with them. Right. So I can't, I, I can't be that upset about the group that I have nothing to do with. I do have something to do with the people on the left, so I want them to be better because they're giving me a bad name. Yeah, that's kind of my philosophy, too. I mean, I'm, I'm moderate, I'm conservative in a lot of areas, but my anger towards the left being bad shit crazy, as they are now, is that they're killing... Mm-hmm the left and the left is important this country is built on checks and balances we need the right wing and the left wing to constantly f- clash that's how we work yep. if it was all right wing policies in this country we'd all be in a fucking slave factory in China working for some 8 year old girl who's whipping us and if it were all liberal we'd all be <laughs> on the government tit and we'd never leave the house and we'd all be 900 pounds like the end of Wally so this sort of fight back and forth in the middle that's where America is great that's why we have a yeah. democratic republic. So when I see the left gone completely batshit crazy, I see them killing themselves. And what's left is is the the moderates and the far right who scare me just as much, if not more. So I'm with you. We, we yeah, kind of well, we want them to get their shit together, basically. Yeah. Well, I promise this will be the last time I, I loosely quote Bomar in this. But you know, he's been saying about this politically co- correct uh, atmosphere that we're having. You know, he had a show called politically incorrect, which right. I think we desperately need to have back again. But he keeps saying that, you know, all this free speech shit is coming from the left. And what he says is, I'm the liberal in this game. So if you guys are attacking me, right. you're attacking the wrong person. Right. Uh, so that, that, that's where I sit on it. Like, I'm the liberal. I will always stand up for the little guy. Uh, but that doesn't mean that all logic is gone, all history is gone. Uh, and the the normal liberals, the, the rank and file liberals, need to start waking up because otherwise we're just going to be dragged. We're going to be dragged the way that regular conservatives were dragged by the Tea Party, and then everything that we say about the Tea Party will be true of us. Yes, that, that's seriously fucked up. Absolutely, it's way more divide and conquer uh, plan. It's very scary because most people are centrists and moderate for the most part. There's maybe abortion. Gay marriage used to be a real hot button issue. It still kind of is, but it seems like it's less. But really, there's like these three or four topics that people are never going to agree on. And of course, that's what everyone focuses on because we like to watch people fight. But the rest of the shit, the 96 other percent, we're pretty much in agreement. We want fair tax code. We want to be able to fucking have upward mobility in this country. We want 
to be Americans, we want the two cars and the goddamn you know picket fence and all that stuff. I think we agree across the board on most things. So sure, I'm, and look, that that's why so much of this is so stupid too, because yeah. something like gay marriage, which of course if you're a liberal, you're for gay marriage, right. and actually if you were if you were a true Republican, if you were a true conservative, small government conservative, or even a libertarian like yeah. Rand Paul, you actually should be the most for gay marriage, because if you were for small government and states' rights, you wouldn't care who someone slept with, you wouldn't care if they smoked medical marijuana in the privacy of their own home. So there's a, there actually is an interesting convergence, I think, of like the libertarian wing and what should be the liberals should be standing up for the same thing. I agree, they, they do. Uh, and and I, hope, I hope we see more of that. We do. I mean, I've been making more friends with libertarians than anyone in the last year, at least in my social media life. I find them for the most part, f fantastic people. And they have said it. They were the ones that said uh, they're completely for gay marriage because they don't think marriage should be decided by the government. It shouldn't be something mm -hmm. that we have to even discuss. Like, why is it being discussed whether this should be illegal or not? It's not for the government to decide who you can marry. So we, again, right. so we are know, starting to agree, which is cool. Sure, and we did, I don't know if you guys saw Rand Paul on CNN about a month and a half ago. Uh, they were asking him what he stands for in gay marriage, and he said that he believes that the religious institution of marriage is between a man and a woman, but he said, as long as you give people uh, the same exact rights by the state, so that, so that gay people are allowed to you know, get into the same contract that the state is granting straight people, then if, religi if religious institutions only want to marry straight people, if there's some institution that wants to do that, then he thinks that's fine. And I went on my show and I defended him because I don't need the government to force a religious institution to do something they don't want to do, even if I disagree with it. Right. Uh, but as long as the state, as long as the state says, yeah, oh, you and this dude, you want to enter the same thing that that chick and that chick want to do and that chick and that dude want to do, then, then fine. Mm -hmm. And I think when the Republicans get past that, look, it's a pretty sad state of affairs if, if gay people have to vote Democrat just because the Democrats are letting them get married. That's pretty sad. That is and I actually think when this, gay when this gay marriage thing is out of the way, I think you're going to see a huge percentage of, of gays move, uh, move right. I do, too. Well, I mean, we could talk about this stuff all day, but let's I'm going to bring this to the exact point of what we wanted to talk about, which was specifically yeah. political correctness and its effect. Mm -hmm. We both agree negative effect on comedy. And I just want to preface this by mm -hmm. saying you're, you're a stand up. I've been around stand up my whole life. Stand-up comedy, true stand-up comedy, which isn't, you know... I love Carrot Top. He's funny, but he, I wouldn't consider him a true stand-up comedian, right? Like, a true stand-up comedian... Has anyone ever said that before? I love Carrot Top. My, my, uh, well, my... my Hear that? My boss. <laughs> uh, no, he's funny. I've been to a show. But it's funny, like, yeah. you know, how Anne's funny when she drinks too much. It kind of makes uh, you sad, too. I'm but sober right now, sorry. There is oh. a true stand-up comedian, which... Um, in my opinion, is somebody who is almost a social critic and a very important voice. Uh, an example would be somebody like George Carlin uh, or Richard right. Pryor, and they were funny. Chris Rock and, and when you know when uh, Bring the Pain came out, they were very funny, haha. Mm -hmm. But there was deep shit they were talking about, and I think in order to get there, which I think comics are super important. I think they're some of the most important voices uh, we have because they tell the truth and they disguise it in a way we can all hear it to start censoring comedy to me is worse than any other censorship this country will do or any other censorship I, anyone get behind fuck violent video i'm not going to defend violent video games i don't care but comedy comedy needs to be left alone it is super important it's one of the only ways we right. get along so well that's an irony that's the irony of everything going on right now because you know this all started maybe two weeks ago with seinfeld on that espn radio show and then he doubled down on uh on the Tonight Show or with Seth, with Seth Meyers or whatever it's called, uh, you know, he was talking about this this really benign gay joke that he did about a, a French king swiping his iPhone and his hands look a little limp or something, his wrist look a little limp, and that the crowds are getting weird about that because they don't want to hear gay jokes. Right. And think about this. Jerry fucking Seinfeld, the most politically correct comic in the history of the world, <laughs> Nobody knows what he believes politically about anything. I have literally no idea. I've watched every episode of Seinfeld. I've seen all his stand-up. I've seen him live stand-up. I've talked to him personally. I have no freaking idea what that guy thinks about anything. And yet if he is acknowledging that there is a problem 
with political correctness. That what he's not. It's not the government. It's not like the government coming in. It's not free speech under attack in this regard. It's not the government coming in and saying you can't say this. Right. What he's talking about and what Chris Rock is talking about, and even fucking Larry the Cable Guy, and I can't believe I'm going to give that guy any credit. <laughs> but what these guys are talking about is the fact that audiences we are becoming so ultra sensitive to anything that if you make a joke, a simple limp wrist joke about gay people, guess what? Some gay people do have limp wrists. Yeah. So you can make a joke about it. That's, that's not limp. I'm straight and I have them. Or that, <laughs> there you go. There you go. But that's not, that's not anti-gay bigotry or something like that. No. Just making a joke about something in and of itself isn't. And if everyone just sits there and be offended and outraged all the time, you're, you're killing their ability to actually talk about the important things. Because if you're gonna get on Seinfeld about something so benign like that, just imagine if George Carlin, I, 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 every day something happens in the news and I think, fuck, I wish George Carlin was alive yeah. to do this, to tackle this one. But just imagine people would say he hates women and he, and, you know, he hates religious people and he hates, they, they would say everything about the guy. And this so, is a, this is the thing, what they do is they don't sit there and... Note the slippery slope. Well, it's important to, because, I see a lot of people having this conversation, comics especially, they're like, oh, you, you know, we can't do our comedy. And I look at it and I go, I don't think enough of us are explaining why it's so important. Because we'll say, we mm -hmm. all understand, like, we all feel that there's something wrong about it, but we can't really mm -hmm. explain it. And to me, the best explanation I have found was actually a, a comedian friend of mine, Jackie Beat, who's a um, uh, yep. drag queen. Uh, was mm -hmm. being interviewed, and she'd said it, I think, the best. She said, what are we doing when we're making everybody sensitive and kids? We are raising people, and I quote, thought this was brilliant, kids that have no emotional immune system. And I think right at that point, she hit it better than anywhere else I found, because now if everybody's so sensitive to a joke, which jokes by nature are designed so that you can talk about a heavy subject in a way that doesn't make you super defensive. That's why it's great. That's why we make progress with comedy. Mm -hmm. If you're making somebody so sensitive and you're saying, oh, my God, that can kill you, that can ruin your life, just this gay joke they told, they have no ability mm -hmm. to handle anything else in the real world they're too sensitive they it's like the boy in the fucking bubble with john travolta like that kid had to live in a bubble because uh, a cat hair would land on him and explode that's what you're doing to people right. emotionally and and comedy is important right. so that's what something yeah, i think needs look, to get out there in look, my opinion I, i'm sure you guys remember remember the episode of seinfeld when his dentist tim watley uh converted to judaism and jerry said he's doing it just for the jokes <laughs> and that, and you know, he goes to confession, and he tells the he tells the priest this, and the priest goes, uh, "Well, does this offend you as a Jew?" He goes, "No, it offends me as a comedian." <laughs> and that that's the heart of it. Yeah. That's the heart of it. We we need to be better. You know, think about this. Think about look, Jews basically invented stand up the way it's known as stand up. It sort of it came out of came out of uh, the Borscht Belt, right? Mm -hmm. And it came out of vaudeville before that, which yeah. Jews basically invented. And think about Mel Brooks. Think about this is, a, this is a group of people that within the last hundred years has suffered a genocide, mm -hmm. six million people amongst millions of other people, and Jews then took this horrible thing, and think about the, the stuff that Woody Allen put out after that, and Larry David put out of that, and, and Mel Brooks, and a zillion other people making fun of Nazis, making, making fun of themselves. Yeah. Uh, that's, what, that's what allowed Jews to continue going. Um, and that's why the whole thing with Islam is so dangerous, because now we're picking a group and we're saying, okay, we're not going to make fun of you uh, because you don't want us to make fun of you, and we're actually strengthening the people that want to control us at that point. Yes. Instead of, we should all be working together to get everybody on the train. I want you to be able to make fun of everybody. I want you, I'm so believer in free uh, expression, that if you want to put... Holocaust cartoons denying the Holocaust. I have family members on both sides that died in the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do that, I'm not going to shoot you for it. I will use my free speech to tell you why you're a fucking idiot. Right. But I'm not going to shoot you. And and we live in this time where everybody just wants to fucking get enraged about everything. That's the. And left. you wake up in the morning, you open up Twitter, and you go, "Who can I hate today?" Let's right. Do it. And again, this, this so now we become ultra sensitive. We become. Um, Weak, we're weak, and and it's uh, like everyone talks about the fall of the empire or the Rome when Rome fell, and everyone's like in the back of their mind thinks America eventually this bubble's going to burst if it hasn't already. Uh, but mm -hmm. there is this sort of feeling in the back, like you know, we're not the same as we used to be, and 
I know everybody feels it, but they can't explain it. We are weak in this country. Seriously, we're afraid yeah, of I, we're afraid of a joke. Like a joke offends us, and we're afraid of being seen as politically incorrect. Like th- for me to be called a misogynist, for example, if I cared about that, which I don't, that could destroy my career. That could ruin my entire life if I get labeled that just because some nut job got course, sense of about a joke. So it's a scary time for a lot of comics. They don't want to push that envelope. Some do. They have oppositional disorder because let's face it, comics are fucked up too. And some of them push it yeah. too far, uh, and they, you know, they'll get ousted. And it's just a dangerous thing because yeah. again, it's important to state comedy by design is. One part coping mechanism, uh, which is what you brought up with the Holocaust and Mel Brooks, uh, which is mm-hmm. an essential way to get over depression, to get over trauma, is laughter. Every therapist will tell you. Yeah. There's a saying we all know in our lexicon, laughter is the best medicine. So to take that away. And now, of course, what's left is to fucking medicate people. But you can't take right. away a coping I mechanism. Mean, I'm sorry, we have a delay. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I'll tell you a, a really great example of this. On, on my show about six months ago, during the Indian election, uh, it was the largest Democratic election ever mm-hmm. in the history of the world. And we did a joke on my show, and it was, a, it was something to the effect of, uh, you know, India had the largest election uh, in all history, and uh, the reason people are saying is because either uh, the candidate had a tremendous economic platform, or it's because of his slogan which was thank you come again and then we and then we showed a picture we showed a picture of Apu from the Simpsons oh you're in trouble and I have never I have never in my professional career got more hate towards me than that joke people saying I hate Indians I'm against Indians I was put on Tumblr pages racist Tumblr pages and people were clipping the video and all this stuff and what people don't understand now first off I was I was literally using the catchphrase of a beloved character on arguably the greatest comedy ever. Right. right? So that's number one. So if you want to say that somebody's racist, I guess what you're really saying is that Matt Groening and Harry Shearer and the rest of them are racist. I was just quoting it. Right. But, but even beyond that, as stupid as that is, what people don't understand is that a joke, my joke, thank you, come again, it was implying that maybe people voted twice or something like that. And you could argue whether the joke was stupid or not or right. whatever, fine. Uh, but racism is not based on one instance of a joke. You could say that's a bad joke, fine. If they could go into the history of all the blog posts and videos and tweets and tumblers and every fucking thing that I've ever put up anywhere, if you saw a history of me making anti-Indian comments, well then you could go, ah, there's a little track history here. This guy might have some issue with Indians. But finding one joke that you could argue is a bad joke or not, I'd be happy to debate that, and then going, well, this guy is racist against Indians. That that's that's what's going on right now, and, and that's, I think that's that's what you're talking about, and that's certainly what Seinfeld's talking. About. Absolutely, and that's the scary thing to me because they can literally, in, in one sentence, taking one thing you say out of context, the crazy left can mm-hmm. define your entire career and the way yeah. in which they think you are. They they don't pay attention to intent. They don't do a you know a historical. Um, you know, study on you. They see one thing that offended them, and now you're, you know, a racist or a misogynist. And then well, they go out and start repeating yeah. it, and eventually you get, you can get that tag, and you can, you could have, you food are, could be taken off your table. You're a hundred percent right. And the best example of this, and this is what really started my detachment from the progressives, was when uh, Sam Harris was on Real Time, mm-hmm. and they got into that debate about Islam, and and uh, Ben Affleck called Bill and Sam Harris both racist. Oh, I remember that. And yeah. then, yeah, and if you listened to what actually happened, Sam was saying he's not talking about Muslim people, he's talking about the doctrine of Islam, right. which, which, by the way, is exactly what the, what the left is doing today. Right now, everyone on the left, the progressives right now are all saying, ah, see, this kid that did the shooting, Dylan, whatever his name is, uh, he, he, on his website, he was reading right-wing uh, manifestos, and he was reading all this racist shit, and of course he was. Right. Of course he was. But these are the same people that will tell you when someone blows something up in the name of Islam, they'll tell you it has nothing to do with the doctrine. And then right now, they're thrilled to tell you about all the things that this kid did. But you're, you're totally Brilliant. right about it. You just call someone a racist, and then what happened the next day after real time that day was instead of the, the, the videos and the press on it being an interesting debate 
about Islam and violence and state-sponsored violence and all that, all media and all the other sites were writing, Ben Affleck calls Sam Harris racist. <laughs> right. and, then, and, then it, and then somehow the onus is now on Sam Harris yeah. to prove that he's not a racist. Absolutely. Absolutely, and that's how it. That's that's the scary thing. Like when we talk about the left student speech, they're they're not organized. It's not government uh, infringement on free speech, like you're saying. It's much uh, darker, much more nefarious than that. Yes, it's actually fucking. I mean, let's go back in history. I, I know I'm getting carried away a little, but it is a little bit of McCarthyism and the Salem mm-hmm. witch trials. Because all you got to do is say they're a witch, burn them. You can't prove that someone's not a witch. The onus is on them. They go on trial and they're like, "No, I'm not a witch. Doesn't matter. You're going to get fucking stoned to death." And the same thing with McCarthyism in the in the fifties about getting blacklisted as a communist. They didn't even have to prove it. So what the left has done, the left, the liberal ideology used to be against McCarthyism. That was a right wing thing. And they used to uh-huh. go, what the hell? Look at this. They're fucking with Hollywood. They're, they're blacklisting uh, artists and yep. musicians, the, the left wing, because they, they kind of like some communist ideology. They, they throw them out. They don't work. And these are the people that have become fucking a modern day retelling of McCarthy. And they don't know that they're you're, doing you're, it. And it's weird to you're me. You're 100% right. You're of course, 100% I'm always right. right. I told you That's I'm always right. Example. I warned I'm you. with you on this one. <laughs> Man, this Lexapro must be kicking in. Uh, uh, a great example of that is, you know, that whole Mohammed cartoon contest thing and Pamela Geller set the whole thing up. And then, and then the shooting. What I realized, everyone on the left, what progressives were doing was they weren't outright saying she can't do it, but they would spend 90% of their time dissecting it, attacking her right. instead of the people that committed the violence. Right. So we could argue, you, you could make a great case that she's that she actually is a bigot, and you know what they what she did was unnecessary, and blah blah blah. You could argue all of those things, except as I said before, you could right now do a, uh, a Holocaust denial cartoon contest, which by the way they're doing in Iran. Awesome. You could do that right now, and I'm pretty sure that Jews wouldn't shoot it up. So no. I don't know what that means exactly. I'm just putting that out there. No. That said. Uh, okay. That said, if you spend 90% of your time analyzing when somebody, when the two guys go in to shoot up a cartoon contest, if 90% of your analyzed time is attacking the people that set up the contest, it's not that you're against free speech per se, but you're trying to shame other people right. into not exercising their free speech. Yes. And then what you're saying is, it, it, it's the soft bigotry of low expectations. You're saying, oh, actually, Pamela Geller is right, because if you draw these cartoons, then these people, they can't be controlled, so they're going to shoot people, and then it's going to be your fault. We wouldn't say that about any other group, right? You could, that, that's also the danger in this thing. I'm pretty sure jihadists are not for gay marriage. So I, I'm sure that gay marriage is just as offensive to them as drawing Muhammad, right? Yeah. So should we, not have, should we not have gay bars? Would it be okay if, uh, if a jihadist walked into where I live in West Hollywood and shot up the gay bars? Because that's pretty offensive to them, so maybe we should stop that. That's the slippery slope. Well, that's and, the craziness uh, that's of the left, because if a yeah. right-wing Christian white male walked in a gay bar and shot everyone, it'd be clear-cut, systematic racism. Yeah. A, if a Muslim does it, the left is like, well, no, they were, must have been instigated. They're not, or not all Muslims, they'll say, uh, you know, yeah. because they don't want to offend you know, peaceful religious people that, you know, the good Muslims and I get it, but uh, you know, if you're not willing to offend people, if you're so afraid of offending people, you might find yourself (laughs) attacking somebody who organizes a cartoon contest more than someone who shoots people for drawing. And that's when you should, if you're on the fucking left, go, wait a minute. I, I like my good intentions. I know, you know, the road to hell is paved with them. I like that I'm defending these people, but I'm finding myself defending people that shoot people for cartoons more than someone who put on a contest. That should fucking wake them up and go, oh my god, I'm a fucking asshole. I'm a hypocritical asshole. That's the irony. That's the irony of liberals. We want to be liberal and we want to be tolerant of everything, but you can't be tolerant of intolerance. Right. You know what I mean? This is the liberals constant. You can't be so tolerant that someone could be like, well, actually, I'm going to come to your house and fucking chop your head off (laughs) tonight. Uh, and you'd be like, oh, well, okay, I don't want to offend your sensibility, so, you know, I guess come on in. Can I cook you dinner first? Uh, and that's what, that's what uh, liberals are doing right now. Not what? liberals, not liberals, not, not real liberals. No, the, the, that's, that's why I call them 
the victim off it because it's not the left and liberal. It's yeah. this it's this group of crazy people. Uh, it's not left. Yeah. Left left people are fine. They really the good ones are fine. It's just you should if you're defending a, a terrorist more than Tim Tebow, you've got a problem. I mean seriously, you got to look in the mirror and go, oh my god, I am more upset that a guy prays after a football game than I am somebody fucking throws homosexuals off a building. For being gay, and, and like you both, like you both said, it's the extremes. It's the nut jobs on both sides. Oh. So we have the extreme right who are um, pro life and conservative and blowing yeah. up, you know, abortion clinics. Yeah, that's what we're too. saying. Like kill it makes no them. sense. Yeah, kill them all. I say, kill, line up anyone that's an extremist of any kind and put them in a concentration camp and gas them. Um, that might be you. <laughs> now, now I'm an anti semite. <laughs> But All right, course, but this, oh. this is where this is where liberals just fail miserably, and I, I I hope that you know it's starting to happen. Look, two weeks ago, I think the Seinfeld thing was actually might have been a watershed moment. I do too. People, are, Bill Maher was doing it alone, but I think people are starting to wake up. I've been talking about it for a long time, and I think people are actually starting to wake up. And the stronger that guys like us start becoming with this and be okay believing what we believe in saying it, we'll get the same people back. Because right now they're just being dragged, but they need, they need real voices to bring them back, and I think we can do it. Absolutely. And the, and the last point, and then I'll let you go, is Seinfeld specifically was talking about the sort of political atmosphere on college campuses in this country, which, if anyone's following the news, th- these places, and again, not all colleges, mm-hmm. I'm sure there's some great places where they still educate them on history, they have become sort of this uh, indoctrination farm for insanity. Um, if, mm-hmm. if you follow any, if you follow any story in this news, you start researching it. There always ends up something happening on a campus. Somebody saying something. Somebody lied. Uh, Christina Hoff Summers, a friend of mine, a feminist, Democrat. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. she went. Remember the safe space? They 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 called. You know, they, yep. she had to fucking have armed guards to go talk to women on campus because they were calling her a rape apologist. They were doing the McCarthyism thing. She's for rape. Yep. She is part of the, you know. And if you, we should do a whole show actually, Ned and 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 on the modern state of universities. Let's do that another time. I just want to say that's an important thing that Seinfeld said because he did specify that he would not go to a university. I think that's an important part of it. Yeah, and by the way, by the way, I ramble. Sorry, people are idiots. As someone a little older now, they're morons. Let them get out into the world and then realize that not everything is so clean cut and black and white. And let them get jobs, and then they can decide what they want to pay in taxes and what's fair. (laughs) But they won't work with people. (laughs) Yeah, but uh, so we can't coddle them because the more you coddle these people, then you coddle them for four years. And then you just toss them out into the bullshit, and then they realize that it was all bullshit, and then they need the drugs. Right. <laughs> exactly. You, you fucking lied to them the whole time. Yeah, it's like fucking refinding out that Santa Claus is, is not real. You have to go through that at 20 now. Yeah. All right, Dave, I'm going to let you go. You bring it uh, I loved having right, you on, man. Cool. I, this took a long time to get here. I, I appreciate it. I yeah, know it wasn't thanks, easy. Thanks, Dave. We yeah, loved my you. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. You have a good time. And again, Thank check you. out uh, the YouTube channel, The Ruben Report, and look for his big announcement. When is it? This Friday? Uh, it Possibly. should be like Soon. Monday or Tuesday. It's coming. It's coming this week. It's coming right. this week. Well, I'm a big fan. I urge everyone to check them out. Um, and that's all I got to say. Thank you, Dave. I'll let you go, bro. All right. Keep exercising that free speech because they're coming. For <laughs> I thought he you meant your out. belly. <laughs> <laughs> that too. All right, David. Thank. You. And because right, of that, I'm going to read parts of the manifesto now. All right. Thank you, Dave. Right. Uh, I thought that right. was a great guess. Great. It made right? me think of like oh, while you guys while you guys were talking. It made me think of. Uh, Remember when the the Trayvon uh, verdict was read? Yeah. And the media was like saying, "Oh, well, you know, the the, uh, the the area around the courthouse, we have to have as much law enforcement as possible, even though nothing's happened yet." But the assumption was that African Americans were going to riot. Right now, they that, did though. to me. But that goes to show you, without realizing it, such low expectations. <laughs> That's a very brilliant <laughs> of point. African Americans, without realizing how incredibly insulting that is, they're 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 willing to say or admit that we expect African Americans to riot due to this verdict. Yeah. Therefore, we're going to have tons of law enforcement and military. But to be fair, they do. I mean, they do. Well, they, and I'm not saying they're they're right or wrong because most of the time they've been right. They were right about Rodney King. They were right to loot here in L.A. from that bullshit thing. But you kind of to say that. I know what you're saying, but it's there's just, some truth there because they do. They, they, every time uh, the fucking Mike Brown, 
a black guy attacked the cop and grabbed his gun and tried to shoot him inside his cop car and was shot down like the thug he is. And they were all like, oh, let's protest. This cop shooting this guy that tried to kill right. a cop. But so I'm just saying, mention it like this is, you know, on MSNBC no, you're or right. other people who are on the left. They say this stuff without realizing how much like low expectations they have of people who are, happen to be a minority. Well, it's like Ferrari Shepard said when he was a guest on our show, other people, there is this systematic racism. Right. There's a racism even us three aren't aware that we are guilty of. There is that's what, to me that's racism to sit there and go, oh, blacks are gonna riot. <laughs> yeah. It's very racist, even yeah. though they they are going to. It's also very observant. <laughs> I'm just seeing if this political correct thing works. Politically incorrect thing works because that was a fascinating conversation with David. Um, we should probably wrap up. Yeah, it was yeah. a good show. It's a good show. Really good. Yeah. Did you guys? Think, I like gonna, him a lot. Everyone liked him. I'm going to do this now so people know. I want to give them an insight of how I am after the show because I always hang up and then call you guys. Let's do it live. Let's let people know how crazy I get after a show. What did you guys think of the show? Your silence just means you didn't like it. Well, I was waiting. I'm going to hurt myself. It. Why do, you, why do you guys hate me? Here, ladies first. Uh, Ned. Uh, it was good, right? He was a good yeah. guest. I thought he was a great guest. He's I thought g- he was very insightful, and he was mentioning examples that I was thinking about uh, based off of the topic, the example with Ben Affleck on Bill Maher's show. God, that was so crazy. It, that, to me, was such an eye-opening moment. And, and People called him a hero after that. The left was like, look it's at unbelievable. Ben. Yeah, and if you watch it, he was retarded. He was. He because should be he, embarrassed. Because he was acting emotionally. He yeah. thought by agreeing with what Sam Harris was saying. And what Bill Maher was saying about a fact. Yeah, check that clip out, people. If I remember it correctly, they were talking about how even moderate Islamic members of the moderate group still, right. you know, they still say you have to die if you leave this religion. You have Correct. to be killed. That's yeah. the moderate. So they're saying, again, not all Muslims. I'm sure American Muslims that are kind of like half in, half out of church aren't going to do this. But the doctrine, the law of the religion itself says you have to kill them. Right. So that's all they said. And then Ben's like, oh, they're not all going to kill you. Racist. And it's like, no, no, we're just saying what the what their bible says right they're just quoting it yeah and they were called racist which yep. is again that's what they do all right lots of stuff to talk about we had drugs we had liberals we had fucking crazy politically incorrect censorship fascist mccarthyism this show you got to go back and listen to two or three times i thought about it because there's not always a, a great conversation after these shows like there used to be and i think for a while i got down on myself like where's all the fighting and then i realized trolls we, oh the trolls are gone that is part of it but also there's so many topics we cover in an hour it's really amazing when you think about it i mean there's no other show in an hour that can that can jump around on these kind of topics we did and i think we just kind of melt people's brains because we're so super smart or at least i am so everyone i want you just to digest this take a little time maybe listen to it again later and then you can start to um you know learn what i know and i can help you to become better people because i'm better than you tomorrow it's Father's Day. Thank you, Anne, for pointing to the paper. Sorry I didn't let you talk to, too much today, you guys. But, you know, we had it. We had it. I told you not to fucking worry, you psycho. You were fucking psycho this week. I said I was a little off yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you were so annoying. I wanted to punch you. I, I need plans. Sorry, I'm an Aries. But I, need I it planned, planned the show. I got the guest. I had the topics done. I handled it. So you didn't have to worry. I, I felt out of the loop, so I was, I'm uncomfortable and insecure walking into a situation I'm unaware of. You're very smart. You're a very quick thinker. You don't need to be insecure about that. You should be insecure about your body. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if you want to pick something. <laughs> that or not. Uh, I'm uh, 194 this morning. Wow. That's 12 pounds. Although I haven't eaten since yesterday. So I think once I eat, I might balloon back up. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Remember, tomorrow is Father's Day. If you're white, that means you have a father. And I want you to call him up and say, Happy Father's Day. If you're black, sorry. Do you get your dad a present? No. My dad, I usually text him. And he gets mad, but, but he's hard to get a hold of. He's three hours behind, sometimes two hours behind. He works crazy. And uh, if we ever get time, it's very t- difficult. The, the, the most time I spent with him was actually driving to the airport this year. Wow. Yeah, and I live right next to the airport. I wonder what people like Dylan get their dad, like Woody Allen's daughter. If I was oh. her, I would probably send her a choo-choo train every single Father's Day. <laughs> That's traumatic. Like as a Thank reminder of what he did. Does, do you still get Caitlyn Jenner a Father's Day gift? Yeah. Ooh, that's a good question. He says he's doing? still dad to them. Yeah. That's his role. Yeah. Is but how can he still be dad and a woman? It's confusing. It's confusing. <laughs> that's interesting. I, we should uh, tweet out tomorrow. Happy cre- Happy Father's Day to Caitlyn Jenner. It'd be hilarious. They call Mother's Day, like uh, I am. <laughs> but seriously, again, if you're white, uh, say hi to your dad. Um, and. <laughs> 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 All right, we got to go. Uh, thank Ladies you, everybody. And gentlemen, great show. Welcome 
to the very first underground podcast. And, and, and Frank. It's the and, and Frank. And, and Frank show. Frank should be first. And, and, and Frank. It really should be Frank and, and. But Ann and Frank's funnier. Why are we underground exactly? Well, let me explain it to you as quick as the best way I can. We did a real show for three years. It was immensely popular, as long as you didn't look at our numbers. And we told the truth week in and week out. And that pissed off a lot of people. Because if you want to piss off people, you know what you do? You tell the truth, and that's what we did. But we were forced into hiding. Because we were threatened to lose our jobs. We were threatened with CPS. We were even shown our home addresses by these fat sons of bitches that didn't like the fact that we told the truth. And they wanted to kill us. So we're in hiding now. As Ann and Frank, that's not our real names. You'll never know our real names. We can never tell you our real names because we don't want to die. So join us every Saturday as we sit here and tell you the truth. We don't read headlines and go, oh, this happened. This fits my stupid agenda. We fucking research it. Who does that anymore? Nobody. And that's why we piss people off, because we tell the goddamn truth and we can do it again and again. It's the Ann and Frank Show, and it should be Frank and Ann, because I'm really Frank and the host. And Ann rarely ever talks because I don't like other people to overshine me, because I'm a narcissist. Ann and Frank Show.